Hi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi. I'm uh, Miles Long from Cult of the Dead Cow, and uh, with me are my esteemed colleagues, Mr. Radman and Mr. Flack. Um, and we're here to talk about self-publishing. But first, uh, uh, our pal Adam, uh, Java Man, has a few announcements he'd like to make. Uh, two brief announcements. Just to remind everyone, tonight at 10 p.m., there is the CDC party sponsored by, again, the Call of the Dead Cow, uh, which will be at Crave. Uh, this is over by, is a nightclub that's over by the Planet Hollywood. I don't know if you guys all know where that is. It's across the strip from the Harley Cafe. Yeah. It's a great place. Yeah, everyone had a great time last year. Uh, it's free entrance with your badge. Badge. $2 drinks, 10 to midnight. And we have, uh, uh, I think, three excellent DJs. Uh, it's going to be a goth industrial night. It's, a, again, always a great time. And also tomorrow night, we will be having the TCPIP drinking game starting at 9 o'clock. Uh, we're going to do a slightly different format this year, but as always, it relies heavily on audience participation. So we want people to come and, uh, and ask as many complex TCPIP questions as possible. And if you stump the, uh, the panelist, they have to get uh, blitzed. So please uh, uh, come to our party tonight and uh, uh, come by the drinking game tomorrow night. Thanks. All righty. So now we're going to talk about self-publishing. Uh, <clears throat> first, I'm going to uh, give a little background, uh, talk about content, investment that it will take, uh, actually doing the publishing, marketing, uh, return on your investment, how you can accept payments, uh, how you can get reviews, and then we're going to uh, tell you what it all means and, and answer questions. <laughs> so that's me. Uh, as I mentioned, I am a uh, member of the Cult of the Dead Cow. Uh, I'm the webmaster for the CDC website. Uh, the administrator for the uh, CDC forum. So uh, if you're waiting on your account to be activated, um, I'm the one you should bug. Um, edit the zine, uh, written for the zine, and then I edited the book that we put out uh, last year. Where's All the right. book? You hold <laughs> oh, the book? The book. This is the book that we put out last year, which is, of course, for sale. Uh, come see me. Reasonably priced. <laughs> cool. I like the uh, Osama bin Radman photo up there. Um, yeah, so I'm Radman. Uh, I started a group called Acid in 1990. You might be aware of it uh, if you're in the BBS scene in the 90s. It was an anti art group. Um, I was also featured in uh, Jason Scott's BBS documentary. Uh, right now, what I'm doing is I'm organizing a demo party. Uh, we're going to be in our second year in 2008 called Block Party, which is going to be taking place in Ohio. Um, and I've also done a lot of, I've been involved in a lot of uh, scene publishing and importing for uh, European demo scene publishers. And so that's my whole, that's how I fit in all this. My name is uh, Rob O'Hara. I am and the author of uh, Commodore, which is uh, another self-published book. Uh, I'm a member of the Ninja Strike Force. I, mean, I have to look at the list. I don't know what all I do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I write for uh, Video Game Collector Magazine. I write for um, a lot of different websites. I write for uh, Digital Press. I've written uh, articles in 2600. Um, I write for the logbook. I contributed to uh, Retro Gaming Hacks, which is a, a book that came out through O'Reilly Press, uh, Chris Kohler's book, who uh, is a writer for Wired, and um, that's me. All right. Next. So uh, here's some fine uh, publications that were actually all originally published, uh, self-published. Um, that includes, of course, 2600, uh, the CDC book, uh, Rob's book, Commodore, and then some uh, freaks, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, and then some more mainstream type books like uh, The Celestine Prophecy. It was a huge hit, I guess, in the uh, late 80s, I believe. Um, also, The Joy of Cooking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> These are pulled uh, directly from the uh, Wikipedia list of uh, self-published books, so you've got to represent the WIC. Um, yeah, so that's what all these books have in common, even though none of us are bestsellers, but uh, 
Oh, well. <laughs> okay. Self-publishing versus vanity publishing. Uh, gotta love the Wikipedia definitions again. Uh, Self-publishing basically is good, and vanity publishing is bad. Uh, vanity publishing uh, is where the printer is basically exploiting the author. Um, that's, that's the definition that, that we're using here today. I mean, whatever. It's, it's, you might call, it, uh, call them interchangeable. Um, it's somewhat analogous. Self-publishing is somewhat analogous to uh, shareware or freeware, where the author maintains control of the content and receives most or all of the uh, proceeds, and they're often uh, kind of niche-oriented. So uh, lots of self-publishing is relevant to the uh, computer underground. Uh, there's e-zines such as Frack and uh, Soljo and, uh, of course, CDC. Uh, E-books, websites, and blogs. I know you guys are all familiar with blogs and websites, so we don't really need to talk about those too much. Uh, streaming or shared MP3s, um, Fluid, uh, which is a, an acid uh, production, I guess. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sublabel. Uh, um, then CDC uh, releases tunes, and we uh, run a streaming radio station. And uh, then there's Hacker Voice Radio. Uh, offline, there's magazines like 2600 and uh, Blacklisted 411. And then the uh, CCC uh, uh, zine that I can't pronounce the title of. Um, Lots of books have also been self-published. Of course, the uh, the two or the three that, that we're talking about here today, as well as uh, End of Days, and then some more, um, I guess, more technical type books like Practical Packet Analysis and Security Data Visualization. Uh, and then, of course, there's Hacker Radio, like Off the Hook, Off the Wall, and then uh, the Dark Domain DVD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got to represent for Binrev too. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely, definitely. So, uh, of course, these aren't exhaustive, and if we left your stuff out, then um, sorry. Uh, too bad. So, <laughs> uh, so content. Um, the, ma the main question most people would have is, uh, is my work good enough to be published? And then the short answer to that is yes. Uh, if you have some content, if you, you've written anything, chances are there's somebody that uh, would want to read it and might even be willing to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah, I think even if your story, if you think that you're just like an everyday person in whatever scene that you're in at whatever time, somebody would want to read that. You don't have to be, you know, the leader of some ANSI group or demo group or where's group or hacker group. Just your day-to-day -day involvement and, you know, what your experiences were for that period of time, I think I would find that very interesting to read if somebody published something like that. You know? And uh, even if... You know, you're not a creator yourself. Um, maybe you have a friend who writes or draws or does something, mm -hmm. and you could uh, borrow or exploit or whatever their work and uh, make a buck. Um, but just remember that getting sued is bad. Uh, <laughs> Got to put that in there. Uh, intellectual property rights are, are actually very important, as uh, many people can attest to. Um, yeah. Don't get sued. Um, write original content. Uh, if possible, uh, which Rob can discuss, uh, just write about your experiences. Right? Yeah, my book was basically um, about old BBSs, and, and um, it's just kind of like my personal experiences. It starts with, you know, the first BBSs that I called. Like, it's all, you know, it starts out old 8-bit days, like Apple and Commodore, and it goes through that. And, and uh, like I was telling these guys, it kind of ends like when this World Wide Web came along and <laughs> killed our little hobby. But um, it's, you know, the biggest comment I get from people about my book is, is they tell me, you know, I feel like, well, you told my story, you know, because it's, you know, it's not really a technical book. It's more like a coming of age or growing up at the same time, but growing up online, you know, like a lot of us did. So, um, and like we had talked before, when I first started writing it, I didn't really know that I was writing a book. I was kind of like writing my memoirs and writing you know, all these stories down just because I didn't see anybody else doing that at the time. And um, I got about two-thirds of the way through, and then Jason Scott's BBS documentary came out, and I started seeing, you know, interest in that. And, and you know, I thought, well, you know, maybe there is an interest for that. So that's, you know, kind of where it finished off. And we've talked about how those are different, like different, like mine's more of like just one guy's story. It's not like the whole history of BBS is, you know, like, you know, I didn't interview a lot of people. It's more just like my story as it goes through. But... Um, 
you know, a lot of people think, well, if you're going to self-publish a book, you have to do all this research and do all these things. And you do have to do a certain amount of fact-checking because, believe me, I have got emails from people in Argentina who will <laughs> argue points, you know, like, you know, about specific facts. So you do have to do research. But it's pretty easy, you know, if you're just writing about what you know about. Yeah, and at the same time, right, you're the, you have the only book published of its kind out right now. So that's the only thing on record that people can now use as a reference. I've had... Um, People, um, like I said, it's it's about my BBS experiences. So, I've had people email me and like chew me out because I didn't mention their cracking group. And I'm like, I, I guess I didn't run into your cracking group. But then I tell them, you know, that's your story, you know, and that's yeah. they can do the exact same thing I did. And I think there's a lot of those interesting stories that you know get lost somewhere on the web or or they never get written down. And and these stories are just going to get lost. So that's that's really the one thing I would say is that. You know, all of us have been through stuff that other people want to read. I mean, when I was writing this, when I first started, I thought, well, who's going to want to read my dumb old BBS stories, you know? But the, the number one comment I get from people is, you know, like I said, I feel like you were telling my story. I was there. I remember those people. I remember, you know, calling those boards or whatever. Uh, of course, you can also uh, publish anything that's been previously published if you own the rights to it or if you can get the rights. Um, there's a lot of underground related content that uh, people most likely would would let you uh, use if you just asked, um, or you know maybe you're affiliated with the Easy and it's been around since 1984, and uh, you decide you want to publish a book like we did. Um, okay, maybe there aren't that many of those, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's possible. Um, also, of course, then there's uh, licenses that that you can use to your advantage, like the uh, Creative Commons and the uh, uh, free documentation license, um, which I guess also with uh, with it publishing, it doesn't have to be a book. Um, in, right. uh, in Radman's case, they did the uh, the dark domain DVD. Yeah. So I ran an, an FTP site on FTPCDROM.com back when it was the largest FTP server in the entire world at one point, and uh, we ran an ANSI archive. And we had people that uploaded ANSI art packs and ASCII art packs and different artworks. And we collected this for numerous years, even after CD-ROM.com got sold out and transferred to you know three different companies. And eventually, um, it was becoming difficult to afford the bandwidth. So we put it out on a DVD for people to buy. And basically, we put it out there so that people could just have it. it you know, it's easily accessible on their you know DVD drive, and they don't have to worry about. You know, are we going to be able to fund the FTP server tomorrow? They have it, you know, at their fingertips at any time. So we put that out. There's a lot of other. Um, there's another DVD out called Mind Candy, where they, um, a group called Hornet, went out in FuseCon and they obtained permission from different demo scene groups, and they put a bunch of uh, PC scene and Amiga scene demos on DVD video to watch. So there's that's another example of scene publishing as well. Um, you can also. Uh as I said, you could obtain the distribution rights if you know somebody that uh, that has published something elsewhere. Uh, you just need to be careful to follow copyright law. Um, maybe you could talk about Freaks a little bit, which is sure. what, published in Europe originally. Is that right? Uh, yeah, it's actually written by a Hungarian, printed in Germany. So there's some really interesting. It's the the book is in English, but it has some very interesting English in it. Um, so I import that book and uh, sell it on Amazon as well as a site called Freaksbook.com. And so when I started putting this out, I you know, had this out on Amazon for a while. Their, their pricing scheme is mm, kind of not very competitive with other ways that you can sell products, and we'll go over that in a bit. But um, I, I started receiving emails from people in Europe that were trying to sell stuff uh, from the demo scene, and they're basically asking for my help to sell it in the United States. So now I'm importing a whole bunch of stuff, like uh, some books, DVDs. Some of it's in the vending booth today. I brought some stuff. But... Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that I'm importing now from Europe. Okay, uh, aside from content, um, you need an audience, uh, which is actually much less important than the content, because if you have the content, you'll find the audience. So you shouldn't write to the audience. You should uh, just write whatever you're going to write, and the audience will find you. Um, of course, you also need time. It does take time to uh, put something together. Um, and... People will notice and uh, nitpick if you don't take the necessary time and uh, don't work on all your formatting correctly and things like that. Um, yeah, uh, it takes money. Um, online, obviously, cheaper than offline. Um, I mean, if you're just running a blog or something, it's mm -hmm. either free or very cheap. 
Uh, if you're going to buy a book, uh, or publish a book, rather, um, most likely need to buy an ISBN, um, which I say costs about $25, but they actually have to be purchased in blocks of 10 or more, so right. uh, it's at least $250. Yeah. Some publishers will give you the ISBNs if you publish with them, um, or you can, if you're in the United States, the person responsible for assigning ISBNs is Bowker, but um, it you know, differs from country to country. Um, there's also people that resell ISBNs. You kind of have to be wary of that if you're buying an ISBN online because uh, there's no guarantee that they didn't just sell that ISBN to somebody else last week. So you need to make sure, if you're buying an ISBN from an ISBN reseller, you need to make sure that they're reputable. Uh, your best bet, though, really is just buy the block of 10 from Bowker because then you're secure. You don't have to worry about that when somebody rings something up at you know uh, on a price scanner that it's going to show up your product and not somebody else's. Uh, you should mention that... Um you don't necessarily have to have an ISBN number or a UPC code. It just depends on uh, how you plan on selling your product. Right. Like if you're just going to sell it through your website, you don't have to do that. Um, I know that on Lulu, which is uh, who uh, the Cow's book and my book, we both publish through Lulu. They have a package for it's ninety nine dollars. You get a UPC and an ISBN number, and that worked out well for me because I'm not publishing a lot of books. You know, it's just like a one time one-time deal so it may it cost a little bit more but it was you know from the same place I was publishing so it was a lot easier mm -hmm. um, you also uh, mentioned UPC um, apparently $89 is actually uh, on the low end that's probably through a uh, yeah, less than reputable reseller, reseller. Um, yeah. so you might want to be uh, be careful of that I guess publishers as, as well can you know potentially offer you a UPC code if you print plan on you know selling it through Amazon a video is going to require UPC if you're planning on selling a book on Amazon you're going to need an ISBN period uh, barcoded and so um, same thing you have to buyer beware if you're buying UPC it's it's almost cr um, cost prohibitive though to try and get a UPC on your own if you just want it for one product so you kind of have to go through a publisher or find somebody that's going to resell that um, you can also if you're doing a, a, a serial um, get the ISSN which is free um, I believe it's ISSN.org. Uh, it's just uh, standard. It was an international standard serial number. Um, just kind of an identifier, and uh, it is helpful if you want to be uh, if you want to have your magazine or your zine sold in a store. Uh, I, I don't think it's necessary, but it is uh, it, it, it is helpful. Yeah. Um, and then also uh, you could get ISBN for a specific issue, but then it would have to be one for each issue. Um, whereas the ISSN is for the serial itself. <coughs> Um, various types of, of uh, self-publishing if you're doing a book uh, print on demand or a short press run um, different costs involved there print on demand is uh, like lulu.com um, there's some other sites as well uh, very little cost you basically you upload your manuscript and they print it whenever someone orders it uh, you have no inventory to manage they do all the, the inventory all the shipping uh, it could be free uh, feasibly if you don't buy an ISBN and you don't uh, buy a copy for yourself uh, so you could feasibly make money and never actually spend any money. Um, I mean, but of course you're going to buy a copy for yourself because <laughs> you want to show your mom or your dad or whatever. <laughs> like, here's the book I wrote, right? Um, also, short press run, um, that's probably a little more professional. Uh, the, the printing is going to be a little higher quality, the binding a little higher quality. Uh, but you have to buy between 500 and 1,000 copies uh, initially. Any? I, don't have anything I agree. Like yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, here's some sites that you can use if you want to self-publish. Uh, both uh, both Commodore and the Book of Cow are published through Lulu, but we're not like we're not shilling for Lulu. It's just the one that we've used. Um, they have pros and cons, just like all the other sites. Um, several other sites here. Author House, uh, I haven't used, but they look it looks pretty promising, um, though their site was a little uh, difficult to find if there is an upfront cost or not. Um, so that was a little, little disheartening there, I guess. Um, though they will give uh, help with professional design and layout, copy editing, and uh, promotion, and um, you only have to buy one copy. Uh, Book Surge is uh, owned by Amazon. Are you familiar with that? No. No. Um, they they will do either print on demand or a short press run. It costs a hundred bucks, uh, I believe, to set it up. Um, they offer publishing packages, and I couldn't figure out exactly what that meant. Um, 
and total design freedom. And I'm also not quite <laughs> sure what that means. Um, but the royalty depends on the distribution channel. If you buy a bunch of copies, the royalty is pretty low. The royalty paid to them is pretty low. Uh, if you uh, just want it sold through Amazon, then it's going to be pretty high um, using their standard pricing. Um, you can buy as little as one, but I believe they recommend uh, more than that because they, well, want your money. Um, Cafe Press, uh, print on demand, no upfront costs, no other services offered, and uh, not very good quality. But you can set the royalty so you can make however much or however little uh, you want in addition to the cost of the book. Um, iUniverse is supported self-publishing. Uh, costs at least 300 bucks up to about 1200 uh, but they will help you with design, layout, and editing. Um, and marketing as well. Uh, you get 20% of your printed copies, 50% if you sell online or uh, like an ebook. Uh, Lulu, which uh, Rob and I are both more familiar with. Uh, print on demand, zero upfront cost. They'll help with editing, they'll help with graphics, translation, marketing, publicity, and you set your, your markup yourself. And you can buy as little as one copy at a time. Uh, then, just to kind of change it up, I included Snapfish on this list. Um, they only publish photo books uh, between five and twenty bucks uh, to set it up, and uh, no additional services offered. And you, as far as I know, you can't mark up the uh, the price. You just you're giving all your money to Snapfish, but they are pretty professional looking, uh, basically photo albums, photo books. Um, yeah, again, this isn't comprehensive. This is just a few sites that we looked at. And uh, don't blame us if you pick one of these and they screw you over or something like that. Uh, all right. Hey, um, do you want to talk about the process like of dealing with Lulu? Like, Sure. Um, basically, what these sites do is they take your user-created content and they turn it into a book. So like when I dealt with Lulu, they will let you upload a Microsoft doc if you want, or you know if you want more control over the layout, you can upload like a PDF. Or, I mean, they have several different formats that they accept. But but basically, the way these websites work is, I mean, you just go to a website and you've already created your content and you upload the content. They have um, a certain amount of checking where they make sure that it's compatible uh, with their books. But um, like I did my cover in Photoshop and, and uploaded that. I uploaded the book. They have uh, templates available. All these sites that we've checked out have templates available online. So, you know, like when I wrote my book, I just wrote it, you know, in, in Word. And then when I was ready, I downloaded their template, cut and pasted into that. And, and when you're done, they either you can upload through their web interface or, uh, you know, you can FTP it up. But, but that's basically, it, it's really, really easy. It's deceptively easy. Um, you know, people come up to me and they're like, Man, how did you get a book? I go, well, I just uploaded it. <laughs> they printed it. It was kind of magic, really. <laughs> so it, it's really easy to do, and that, that's one of the things that we really want to convey is that, you know, if you've got that story, you know, and like a lot of us, you know, you have something that you wanted to get out there. This is a really good way to do it. Like like Miles said earlier, you know, if you write what you know about, it, we're not talking about writing things here. They're going to be on the bestsellers list. I mean, they ought to be, but they're not. So. Um, you know, if you have a smaller market, this is a really good way to do it. All right. Marketing. You're selling yourself uh, as much as you're selling your product. So basically, you're going to try to sell your friends, your family, your coworkers, everybody you know. Because um, you want to get it out there. You want to get people talking about your book or your, your DVD or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, Use every contact you have, and then try to make sure that they use every contact they have, and then uh, eventually you get a review uh, published on Slashdot, like Rob did, and uh, you sell hundreds of copies of your book. Thank you, Jason Scott. Where's Jason Scott? <laughs> so yeah, um, talk to your friends, let them talk, or tell them to talk to their friends, and so on. Uh, online marketing. You need a book-specific website. It could be its own domain, it can be part of your other domain, it can be even it could be on uh, like GeoCities or whatever. You just need a, a site for your book that you can direct people to. 
I mean, obviously, if it's its own domain or if it's on your own domain, it's better. It's going to look better than if it's like a GeoCities thing and has Yahoo ads popping up everywhere. But even if you have that, that I mean, that's better than nothing. Because it's somewhere you can direct people to. Uh, press releases. Uh, Lulu and uh, some of these other sites will actually give you templates for the press releases, give you ideas uh, how to set those up. You can also go to uh, like PR Web and just read book press releases and kind of copy their their formatting, use some of the the terminology that they use. Um, forums, put links to your book in your forum signature. Uh, that actually can get you quite a few sales. Uh, same thing with blog. If you have a blog or if your friend has a blog or whatever, uh, mention it. Um, put it in, you know, put it in the comments. Or comment about it in other people's blogs. Put it in the comments in your blog. Put it in, uh, put it like in your sidebar or whatever. Uh, same thing with websites, e-zines. Advertise everywhere you can if it's free or if it's cheap. Uh, you want to get your story out there. You want to get your book out there. You want people to see it. So that's the only way to do it. Um, did you want to talk about podcasts, Rob? Um, well, maybe not podcasts specifically, but really, like the way I advertised my book was if you have a, a big product, you can afford to do this uh, shotgun advertising. You know, you just blow it out there and then you hope people find it. When you've written a book about, hey, I like to copy games on the Commodore 20 years ago, you have to find your market. <laughs> you know, that market is not at, at Walmart. So what I did was, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm on lots of um, uh, retro computing forums. I'm on, uh, I found, you know, retro podcasts. I found people that would be interested in my book, and then I contacted those people. So I did a more specific marketing. I was at... Um, Convex, the Commodore Vegas Expo last weekend. Um, last fall, I was at the uh, Chicagoland Commodore Convention. So, I mean, I've I've sold quite a few books. I guess I've sold more than the average or whatever. But but it's because I found those people. You know, if you're, you know, and and like I said, depending on you know like what you've done, you know, and and even Miles, it's it's all about finding those people because there are people out there. We all know, like with with blogs and, and news sites, they're dying for information. So you just have to find the right people that are and, and you know, be willing to give a little bit of your time and, and they'll really help you out. Yeah. The number one way that I that I distribute this or, you know, kind of get the word out about the dark domain D V D that Acid put out, which has all this anti artwork and scene magazines and everything, you know, archived worth of you know, twenty words uh, twenty years worth of releases is that I is basically cons and meetings and conferences, uh, demos and parties and everything like that. Uh, we sponsor events. If there's like a online competition where they're having, you know, who can program the best, you know, 4K demo or something or the best text mode animation or something like that, uh, we'll offer up, you know, DVDs and books as prizes. And that, I think that's one of the best ways you can advertise and get your product out there because it's like, it's free advertising in a way. I mean, you're giving away your product, you know, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's an, it's an offer of goodwill and um, it gets the name out there. And um, even Cult of the Dead Cow, they, they offered up some signed copies. You know, I don't know how many Cult of the Dead Cow members autographed the book, but uh, that was an awesome, I mean, people were like so honored to receive that. You know, it was awesome. Because we're cool. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he made a good point, though, that uh, giving, don't be afraid to give away free copies. Um, that's going to help you get reviews, which is going to help you sell more copies. So you give a few away for free, and you sell a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, it, it hurts at the beginning. I mean, you know, because it's not like, you know, you're, you're in a band, and, and you've got, you know, a thousand promo copies to hand out. Every time I give out a copy, you know, it's coming out of my pocket. It's copies that I've personally bought through Lulu or whatever, mm -hmm. but... You know, I mean, one of the copies I sent out got reviewed in Video Game Magazine, and one of them, you know, it was in Tips and Tricks last month. So, I mean, it does pay off, and, and those do lead to sales. But, you know, at the, at the very beginning, when you're paying the money down and, and mailing them out, it's hard. And uh, yeah, I guess basically the same, the same stuff works offline as online. Press releases, uh, try to get mentioned in, in uh, print magazines as well as online. Uh, and then come to cons like this and uh, talk about your your product or uh, set up at the the vendor area or whatever. Uh, common trap would be writing for marketing, which I think we already mentioned. Uh, don't write don't write for the market. The market will find you if you have something to say. If you have something, if you're at all creative in any way, then the market will find you. 
um, and I believe this was uh, this was Flax line, which was uh, thinking about marketing first is like writing pop music. So uh, you're you're just doing it to sell, and that's that's not the right reason to do this type of thing. Selling is good, but you know that's that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because you actually have something to say or something that you want people to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, how many copies can you expect to sell if you publish a book? That really depends on whether you're writing to make money or just to get your ideas out there. Um, if you're writing to make money, um, most likely by self-publishing, that's not the way to make money. Um, you can make some, but it's not going to be. You're not going to be able to make a living on it, most likely. Um, I, there are exceptions, of course, but it's pretty unlikely. Uh, you can sell at cost. So if you're not, you don't really care about the money. You just sell for whatever it costs the uh, the site to do the printing and the binding. Um, of course, you can mark it up for a profit. Uh, printing is cheap, pretty pretty cheap these days on some of these sites. Um, so we actually uh, make about 32 percent on the book of cow, and we sell it for uh, 13.37. So uh, we make what like four dollars per book. Um, which then goes back into buying more copies of it, which is how I have some here today. Um, so actually, we haven't really made any money. It's just all gone back into the, the project. The, the way um, uh, Lulu works, like I said, again, I should say we're not really shilling Lulu. It's just the ones that we both happen to use. But um, after you upload your book, they have a set uh, printing fee and then it's so much per page I think for black and white it's two cents a page or three cents that's a page that's right yeah and so um, uh, then you get this total and like I think the total on my book is like six dollars somewhere around there on Lulu um, and then after that you just name your price and then they have a split it's a 20-80 split they get 20% of anything over that set amount and you get 80% so there there is a lot of room for markups and are you do you have a slide later where you're talking about selling through Amazon? Yeah, or? yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, I think that's coming up next. But, but the the highest profit margin is buying the books yourself and selling them to people you know. Just like everything else, the more people that touch it, everybody starts getting a chunk of that money, and so we're going to talk about that later on. Um, also, sales depend on your audience. Uh, as I said, audience isn't that important, but, I mean, it, it is important. You, you know, you... Mm -hmm. If you're selling something that is very similar to something else that's already for sale, uh, a book that someone else put out the last year or the six months ago or whatever, um, you're less likely to, to have sales as if maybe you held that for another year or so. Um, but uh, differently, I guess, than traditional publishing, it's print-on-demand works can be uh, available forever, essentially, with no inventory. Because um, it's just sitting in a, a database on Lulu's site or whoever, whatever um, publishing site's uh, server, and it just no, no. There's no physical inventory, so uh, it can be available ten years from now. Whereas a uh, a traditional publishing, uh, it would be out of print by that time. Uh, which that allows the audience to find the work. So you know, maybe your book isn't selling right now, but it could be sell. It could sell five years from now if it's still available. Whereas if it is out of print in five years, no one's going to find it, even if there is a market at that time. So. Okay, the average self-published book sells approximately 200 copies in its lifetime, according to that site there. Um, Commodore, in a little less than a year, has sold about 500 copies. Uh, so apparently, BBS memoirs are big sellers. So, uh, as uh, Flack was saying, there's a lot of uh, a lot of other people that have their BBS story. So uh, maybe somebody in the audience here, or uh, one of our viewers at home, <laughs> could uh, write their story and and you know mention those uh, cracking groups that he didn't mention. If it's something that <laughs> that was that affected them more, um, I guess freak. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say again though. You know, that's not like people just found my site and, and you know just bought copies. That's been a lot of traveling around and traveling to Vegas mm -hmm. and Chicago and, and different kinds of shows. So, I mean, um, it's what, you, you touched on it whenever you talked about um, being your own marketing person. But when you self-publish, you're really your own everything. I mean, from coming up with the content to the design, the editing. Um, you know, and and it doesn't end. I mean, after it's out, you're your own marketing. You're your own publisher. You know. Uh, promoter, 
you, it's it's constantly working. So it, it's a lot of work to sell that many copies. Yeah, just a footnote for freaks. Um, that only represents how many were sold in the United States. Oh, okay. uh, there's also distributors, you know, for people that can navigate a Hungarian website or a German website. Uh, <laughs> um, still, that's you yeah. know, a hundred copies in yeah. the U.S. essentially yeah. in uh, about two years at thirty-seven dollars each. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good deal there. Um, Book of Cow, we've sold about one hundred and fifty copies in a little less than a year. Um, all of its content has been available for free for more than 10 years, but uh, we've still sold 150 copies. <laughs> so um, that just shows that there is a market for previously published content, even if it's previously published content that uh, is available for free mm -hmm. uh, and has always been available for free. Uh, Dark Domain has sold about 800 copies in three years. That's also, again, previously published content that was available for several years mm -hmm. uh, before it was put out on DVD. Yeah. Still is available for free, too. So it's just so, if you want it all yeah. packaged nice. Again, same thing with the, the yeah. Book of Cow. Those text files that are in it are, are freely available on the CDC site. They're available on textfiles.com. They're available all over the place. and uh, Or you can get them nicely bound like this. Um, it's up to you. And I heard a statistic from Jason. He sold over 2,500 copies. 2,800? 2,800 copies of the BBS, of BBS documentary. documentary. Again, which is uh, Creative Commons licensed. So, yeah. Yeah. so it's effectively free as well. Uh, accepting payments. This is if you're using, if you're managing your own inventory, basically, if you're not using a site like Lulu. Right. So everything that I deal with, I manage inventory of physical inventory nothing's being like printed or pressed on demand all the books that I have I have like in basically in my own inventory um, and there's a lot of different options you have to accept payments you know to sell these you know these products that you have be it books DVDs or something else um, the number one way that people use is uh, or actually if you want to get something on amazon.com and it's not there already then you have to set up an Amazon Advantage account if you have distribution rights for that product. I um, can't really see the slide that well, but uh, there's a lot of fees basically involved. Uh, there's a $30 annual fee. Uh, they take 55% of your sale, which is a huge percentage. Um, and then if you know once you're once they're ready to cut you a check, once you've accrued over $100, they charge you a $15 check fee on top of that. So this is like the least competitive program available but at the same time it gets your product on amazon.com and that's the that's the funny thing is you know we're selling this book uh, freaks book for like 30 some odd dollars and uh, on Amazon it's marked up to almost sixty dollars and we're still practically losing money on it and I mean it's just totally it's totally ridiculous but people are willing to pay that um, because they trust Amazon and that's that's, you know, that's, there's the name Amazon behind it. So uh, one of the reasons that they do, you know, to be fair to Amazon, I don't want to slam them too hard, is they're managing that inventory. So they'll order, for example, when you start the account, they'll order like five or six books or DVDs or what have you from you. And then uh, some sort of an algorithm or something that tracks the success of your um, product because then later on it'll say, okay, uh, give me 30 of these. And then if... Nothing, if there's no activity, they go, oh, just give me three. And so they'll keep reordering and re-upping like that. And if it's really successful, they'll, they'll order in the dozens. If they're just trying to keep it available, then they'll just order one or two. So I have a lot of different products um, on Amazon.com. You can actually compete with Amazon.com uh, with your own product by joining what's called the Amazon Marketplace once it's established and on the site. Um, there's a lot... It's you know it's a little bit more competitive. They only take 15% cut of the sale instead of 55. Um, st still have a couple other little um, transactional fees which add up to around uh, a little over two bucks. But you're still making um, you're still keeping a lot more of that money yourself. Uh, the difference is that you're not shipping to an Amazon warehouse and then that goes out immediately from Amazon. You're actually shipping directly to the seller, uh, like you would with just like you know uh, eBay or something like that. Um, so. Yeah, just one point though is you, the product has to be on the Amazon website before you can add it as a marketplace item. Uh, um, in my experience with Amazon, <laughs> since we're all talking about how much we love Amazon, um, like I was saying, if I purchase my book with no markup at all, it costs me about $6. So if I sell it for 15 I make about $9. Now if I sell it for the same price through Lulu, they take 20% of that profit. Amazon. 
Lulu. Well, Lulu. Lulu. Sorry. So, so now you've got this certain amount. Now, when I purchased the uh, UPC and the ISBN, they automatically submitted my book to 13 online retailers. Mm-hmm. So now my book's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, Borders dot com, now all the online websites. Mm-hmm. Amazon. If you buy through Lulu at that point, I make like five. Maybe five dollars or something at that point. Amazon has a four dollar and fifty cent handling fee per book. <laughs> it's slightly it's slightly less, but I know that I get these checks for like seventy eight cents <clears throat> through Amazon. So, uh, so it, it is this thing. You know, if if you buy it from me on the street, you know, I make a lot more money. But the odds of that aren't very good. Versus, you know, when people say, "Oh, well, you know, you're this guy and you got books in your backpack," you know, versus. You know, they'll go to Amazon. They feel a lot more safe, you know, using their credit card at Amazon or, you know, I mean, if you search for my book at Google for a long time, my website shows up. Now Amazon starts to show up, you know. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it is a, people feel safer dealing there, but they kind of stick it to the little guy. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's always PayPal. Um, they're probably, you know, they're probably the most competitive in the marketplace if you want to sell your own products and you stock your own inventory. Um, they're really only taking around 3%. Um, unless you're in a, like, a really high sales volume, um, they're going to basically charge you 3%. Um, it's not available in all countries, but um, that's because, well, from my own experience with other um, credit card processors, that's because a lot of these other orders from foreign countries are like tend to be fraudulent. But... Um, they have, they support 190 different countries, so that's you know, and the base is growing it, you know, all the time. Um, another really good um, credit card processing and payment payment processing um, company that I use is called Kagi. Um, they charge a slightly higher uh, percentage, and then they also charge a credit card fee on top of that if it's if the payment's coming in through credit card. But they accept the by far the widest variety of credit cards. They even accept like JCB, which is you know unheard of, and whole bunch of other different, you know, off-the-wall type of uh, credit cards or foreign credit cards. Um, and, uh, and the, you know, they don't discriminate on what country you're, you know, you're coming from when you, you know, place an order. Uh, of course, the best way is to set up a DBA account um, with your bank. That, that means you have to go through the bro- um, process of um, creating an assumed business name, and that varies from state to state what you have to do in order to do that. Um, like in California, you have to place a... Uh, an ad basically in a local newspaper or a fictitious business name statement announcing that you're going to conduct business under a certain name. Um, and that's just basically a check and balance to make sure that you're not going to say, I'm going to conduct business as McDonald's or something like that. You know? um, and then you can accept and you know, process checks under whatever business name you want. And there's no fees. Okay, reviews. Yeah, there's, there really is no such thing as bad press because... Uh, any press is good because it gets people talking about your book or your CD or your DVD or whatever it is. Uh, good reviews come from people who are excited, so you you got to be excited about it. I sound really excited right now, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> you have to be really excited about it if you want uh, people to give you good reviews. You have to say, yeah, this is great. It's awesome. This, this is the best book ever. I can't live without it, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, never stop promoting because we're we're all still being reviewed a year after uh, we publish, or a year or more after we publish. It just takes time for reviews to come in. Uh, find target websites, um, as Flack was mentioning. Um, you know, if you're writing about uh, Commodore BBSs, you should find like retro gaming websites and Commodore websites and things like that. Um, Give free copies away again. If you want to, if you want reviews, you're going to have to give away mm-hmm. copies. Uh, contact websites, zines, newspapers. Offer to give interviews. Uh, you'd be surprised; people will actually uh, interview people who self-publish books because they say, "Oh, I didn't know you could do that." They, they're just curious, so they'll they'll actually interview you, and maybe it'll run in you know some Podunk Town newspaper. But it's a review, and it's in print. Uh, give electronic or PDF copies for reviews. That that's a, another solution or another alternative uh, that would be cheap or free for you, uh, cheaper than you know giving out a uh, print copy. Uh, 
use people's positive feedback as a uh, as a review. So put it on your book's website and say, so and so said this in a MySpace comment or in a blog post or whatever. You know, even if it's not a formal review, it's still uh, if they say, hey, this book was great, you should mention that. Um, again, talk it up to your friends and have them uh, write about it and review it and and whatnot. Make sure that you have everything set up before you start asking for reviews, though, or your reviews will be bad. Um, if you don't have your website set up, they'll say, well, I, I couldn't even figure out how to order the book. Or, uh, you know, if, if your uh, website says under construction or whatever, they, they won't come back. They'll, you know, move on to something else, move on to the next book. So, you guys have any anything to add about reviews? Get slash dotted. Get slash dotted. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that, that would help. I sold... Um, I, I uh, started selling my book at a, a computer convention, and over a month I'd sold about 30 copies. And then um, after uh, Jason's review of uh, Commodore Grant on Slashdown, I sold 100 in like 24 hours. So I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so the conclusion is that everybody should do this because um, there's really no reason not to. Uh, thanks to the internet, everyone can be a published author. So you can all put on your resume that, hey, I wrote a book, or hey, I wrote a zine, or I wrote an article in a magazine, or I published a DVD or a CD or whatever. And you should, you know, share the knowledge and share the wealth because that's like that's the whole hacking thing, right? It's all about information wanting to be free or cheap. So <laughs> there you go. And that is that. Uh, we have a little time for questions, and then we will move to the Q&A room uh, in a few more minutes when they cut us off. So, you, sir. Well, um... Me specifically, this is the first uh, this is the first event that we've been to with this book, um, and we've sold 150 copies. So um, we, I mean, we've sold just through the website. We we did issue a press release, um, and we I think we got picked up on uh, Boing Boing with that, um, but we haven't done any face to face, any any uh, anything, and we haven't really done much as far as uh, reviews either. So it's just been from our website. Of course, we have a pretty high traffic website. Um, I don't know. You guys speak yeah, to that? Yeah, uh, pretty much the bulk of my sales have come, you know, from online. Uh, I run acid.org, which receives, you know, a good amount of traffic still. It's kind of amazing, actually, the amount of traffic it gets. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as marketing goes, really the, the, the main marketing that I've done is through conferences and um, things like that and competitive computing events, and that's about it. And most most of my